Good morning. This is Gresford Thomas, pastor of the Lincoln Amazing Grace, Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm happy to be with you and to welcome you to our second online church uh, service, worship service. Uh, due to the way things have, have uh, gone with the coronavirus, we've had to be adjustable and some of us have gone into Zoom meetings. We had our first uh, Zoom meeting prayer meeting. Uh, some will have to learn how to adjust to that. Uh, we have Zoom meetings also for other types of meetings that will be happening. Um, some of you don't know what I'm talking about when I say Zoom, but you'll soon know as we are adjusting to this different time. But, you know, as I think about it, I, I was reminded of the book of Habakkuk because I think about the fact that we're living in different times. Habakkuk is one of my favorite books because in Habakkuk, he's one of the minor prophets but in Habakkuk, it's a little different than the other prophetic books because usually in a prophetic book, the word of the Lord will come to the prophet and he will speak something to the people. But in Habakkuk, the word of Habakkuk comes to the Lord. And Habakkuk has a complaint before God about the way that things are going in with the Israelites. And when will God intervene? And God answers him and says, I'm going to intervene by sending the Babylonians. And then Habakkuk says, wait a second now, the Babylonians, those are, those are some terrible people. Why would you do that? And then as he's waiting for God to answer that question, I'm going to read in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and wait to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision. And make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. You know, one of the most important things about having a vision and receiving a vision and moving forward with a vision is being in position to receive the vision. And we see Habakkuk, before uh, God even tells him to write the vision, he's in position. He's standing his watch and he's waiting for the Lord to speak. And when the Lord speaks... He tells them to be ready to run with it. I believe that we're living in times when we need to revision how we do church. And the things that we learn now, and I've been speaking to uh, some of you about different things that we could be doing, I believe is not something that we should leave once we are meeting back together as a church family. These are more innovative ways that we can reach out to our community that I believe God is putting us in a position to be able to use for his honor and glory and be able to think about and, and pray about. So I would, I would uh, encourage you to be in the word of God, to, to stand your watch and allow his word to speak to you and, and share it. Let's share it with one another in different ways so that we can see how our church, the Lincoln Amazing Grace, Grace Church, can continue to be a shining light in this community and shine even brighter for the glory of God as we revision through this time that things are just a little different. Hope you have a blessed time as you worship with us. May God be with you. God bless. Happy Sabbath, friends. I'd like to share a story with you about a time when the disciples felt like everything was completely out of control and they were about to drown. And yet they were perfectly safe because Jesus was with them. This is Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And the other little boats were also with him windstorm arose, and the boat waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can 
this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? You know, friends, it's the same with us. If Jesus is with us, we are safe. No matter what is going on in the world around us, we can know that we are safe with Jesus because we have a firm anchor. Jesus is our anchor. Let's sing about it. In your hymnal, number 534, let's sing, Will Your Anchor Hold? You can do it in a hymnal like this, or you're welcome to go to sdahymnal.org and look at number 534 there. We're going to sing the first and last verses. that we are safe, isn't it? Proverbs 18 verse 10 says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. It's because of God's name, which means his character. And it's because of that, who he is, that we are safe. And I can't wait to meet my Savior. And I'm sure you feel the same way. So let's sing about it. Watch ye saints, because Jesus is coming. Number 598. We'll sing the first and last verses, number 598.
of you who don't know me, my name is Eileen Bird and I'm a registered dietitian. And today I'm going to talk to you about how to improve your immune health by eating more fruits and vegetables. Research shows that those who eat more fruits and vegetables have a lower risk of getting colds. One study showed that even just eating one extra apple a day lowered the risk of getting colds. Being obese and physically inactive has been shown to increase the risk of being hospitalized from the flu. But guess what increased the risk of being hospitalized from the flu even more? That's right, a low intake of fruits and vegetables. One study of a thousand pregnant women showed that eating nine servings of fruits and vegetables per day decrease the risk of getting colds more than those who ate five servings of fruits and vegetables per day, as is often recommended. Eating more fruits and vegetables has also been shown to lower blood pressure and decrease the risk of getting cancer, diabetes, and strokes. Vegetables have also been shown to help fight cancer. Tomato sauce, for example, improved prostate cancer markers in one study. So what is one serving of fruits or vegetables? That would be two cups of raw leafy greens, one cup of chopped raw, half a cup cooked, or a quarter of a cup of dry. One cup is equal to about the size of a baseball. And because of the high fiber content of fruits and vegetables, as you increase your consumption of fruits and vegetables, it's also important to simultaneously drink more water to help prevent constipation. So how can you get more fruits and vegetables in your day? Add them to everything you're eating. Get creative with soups, stir fries, spaghetti, casseroles, rice dishes, and tacos. I add garlic and onion to all of my cooking. It's a great seasoning agent. Also try bell peppers, zucchini, spinach, green beans, cabbage, celery, and eggplant. In your sandwiches, add sprouts, spinach, bell peppers, cucumber, lettuce, and tomatoes. And also smoothies are a great way to get more fruits and vegetables. Also try using beans for protein instead of animal sources of protein. Many don't eat enough fruits and vegetables because they feel that they just don't have enough time. Frozen fruits and vegetables can help with this. They're already prepared, they're washed, they're cut up. And a lot of times they're even more nutritious than fresh fruits and vegetables because they're frozen right after they're picked when they're nice and ripe. Try having a lot of prepared fruits and vegetables around so that they're there when you want to eat them. So aim for at least nine servings of fruits and vegetables per day to help protect you from getting sick. In the first chapter of Desire of Ages, page 21, it talks about a circle that operates in the universe. And it's similar to the water cycle. You know about the water cycle. The uh, sun shines on the ocean. It causes evaporation that forms into clouds. The clouds move over the land, drop rain. So I have my little rain gauge actually right here. We got some rain yesterday. And then the rain flows into rivers or streams first and then into rivers and eventually back out to the ocean where the whole cycle completes itself again. Well, there's a similar cycle that operates on a universal scale. It's like the operating system of the universe that God has put into place. And this is how it works. God gives blessings. These blessings might be in the form of sunshine, in the form of fresh air, the fact that our earth has a magnetic field that keeps the sun's rays from stripping away our atmosphere, there's probably more blessings than we can even imagine or count. But what goes back to God? Well, the other part of that cycle is the thanks, thankfulness for God's blessings. So when we 
are blessed by him, we return that thankfulness. It goes back to God, and that completes the cycle of the universe. So by giving our tithes and offerings, we have the chance to participate in a tangible way in that thanksgiving back to God. And we hope that even though we're not in church today, we can't be there physically, but we can still send in our tithes and offerings. And the, way, the easiest way to do that is to go online to lincolnadventist.org, lincolnadventist.org, or you can also mail your uh, tithes and offerings into the church. Good morning and a happy Sabbath. I'm glad to be able to worship with you today. Uh, this is a new venue, but just the fact that we're worshiping makes all the difference. You know, we've got so many things going on in our lives and, and, uh, so many different and new things going on that tend to make us think a little harder, pray a little longer, study a little deeper. And for that, I'm thankful. You know, there's so many people out there right now that are afraid They're scared to death, and they're, they're scared to die. That's primarily because they don't know who Jesus Christ is, or if they do, they don't understand how he can lead them to their life everlasting. You know, in John 14, 1 through 3, uh, Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Is that not a... Is that not a wonderful thought? That all we have to do is believe in God, believe in Christ, put our faith in Him, put our lives in His hands. And He goes, He, he left, He said those words just before He died. And He arose again on the third day to go to prepare a place for us. I feel that that's a reason enough for me. But we need to be able to go out and share that word to others. You know, in John uh, fourteen twenty seven, Christ also said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. God's Word always has a way of speaking to our hearts if we allow it to. You know, we come this morning in a different venue um, that will hopefully end soon with no adverse effects. But until, it, until this coronavirus disappears, or at least is under control, we may meet like this weekly for a little while. And that's okay, because we're still meeting. I trust that you are all able to have a little bit more free time to spare, free time to read the Bible, free time to spend on your knees. I know I have, and I think it's made my walk a little bit better. So this morning I'd like to lift up every person in our church, our community, our state, and the world, that the concerns that they have over this coronavirus, 
with the concerns that they have in general, will be put at ease when they place it in Christ's hands. So, as we go today in prayer, I'd like to just take just about 30 seconds or so to let you, each and every one, go to God yourself. Lay your fears upon Him. Place your concerns in His hands. Let's pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, whose power and glory and magnificence shine throughout each and every day. Lord God, we come before you this morning, on this Sabbath morning, to rest in you. I pray that you'll be with the pastor today as he brings us the message. And I just ask that you would, again, touch each and every heart who hears the word. Father, be with each person and give them the confidence that they can trust in you. Lord God, we have so many elderly in our church, and we'd like to know how we could better serve them. So please put it upon our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I end, uh, I'd like to remind everybody that on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, we do have uh, the prayer line that, that you can call. Uh, Tuesdays is from 7, th- 7 till 7.30, and that's des- designated for family and friends that you would like to have a closer walk with Christ. Whether it's neighbors, your your sisters, brothers, whoever. Um, That's what Tuesday's prayers are for. Wednesday's prayers are for our community and for our church. You can also, if you have prayer requests, you can also send them via email to the church's website, and that's lincolnamazinggrace at gmail.com. It's lincolnamazinggrace at gmail.com. Also, there is has been sent out already uh, information on a hundred days of prayer. Uh, if you haven't gotten it via email, contact the church email and say I haven't received it yet. Chances are, if you haven't, then we don't have your correct email. So please, please contact the church through their email and. We'll get it out to you as quickly as we can. Uh, the email is being checked several times throughout each day. So, bless everyone and have a happy Sabbath. Let us pray. Father, may the words that I speak be seasoned with your love and grace. Open my lips, Lord, that my mouth may declare your glory. May we leave this time together knowing that we have heard your words and not my own. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I'd like to wish a uh, happy Sabbath morning to each and every one of you. I'm very happy to be able to uh, broadcast Once again, to you from our uh, church building here in Lincoln Amazing Grace. My name is Gressford Thomas. I'm the pastor of the Lincoln Amazing Grace Church. And uh, we are broadcasting in this fashion, as you know, uh, due to the uh, COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, Some may be asking, why do I broadcast in this manner? And the reason is simple. As I stand here in an empty room... I, in my mind's eye, I, I see each and every one of you, and I imagine 
uh, you being here. And it, um, it just brings a sense of nostalgia for me, really, and that's the reason that I like to come here and uh, present, plus uh, my, uh, my house right now is not really set up for a studio quite yet, getting there, depending on how long we will be doing this, and uh, maybe I'll be just broadcasting from home. But let's get on to our message today. The title of the message today is Peace Interrupted. Peace Interrupted. I want to talk about peace. And I think you can agree with me that if there was ever a time when that word resonated louder in recent history on this planet, it's now. With the entrance of COVID-19 on our planet, not just our city, not just our state, not just our country, but our world and our planet, we see the devastating effects to the way that we live. I'm not even just talking about the, the uh, virus itself. I'm talking about just the way that we relate to one another and the things that we are doing and, and the fact that we can't find certain things in the grocery stores. You know what I'm talking about. Thursday morning, I was participating in a drive through food giveaway in Penn Valley. We did our church, Penn, uh, Lincoln Amazing Grace, uh, did one on Monday. Uh, Thursday, I participated in one up in Penn Valley. Uh, up there, we have the, the two elders that run the program, and I was just there kind of for moral support, if you will. As the people drove through the drive through I offered them a greeting, and I inquired as to their well-being. How are you today? More times than not, the replies that I received rang with feelings of uncertainty, feelings of anxiety. The people who live up in Nevada County, you know, as you go up to Nevada County, they, they've moved there to experience the peacefulness of, of being nearer to nature. I enjoy going up there, going up there and, and taking hikes. But what I observed is, is that as I spoke to the individuals that were there to receive uh, some food, their peace was interrupted by an uninvited guest, that is COVID-19. The essence, friends, of the Christian life can be described as peace in the midst of trials. For some, as we think about this, this is a trial or a tribulation that we're going through. Let's take a look at what the Word of God has to say about this. In John 16, 33, I want to take a look at that first. John chapter 16, verse 33. In John 16, 33, Jesus is addressing the state of being, of what it means to be at peace. John chapter 16 and verse 33. Now, First, I want to talk about John 16 just a little bit, because John 16 is part of a larger narrative, uh, part of Christ's closing words to his disciples, to the ones that were closest to him on planet Earth. They were words of instruction, words of love, words of comfort to them prior to facing the unthinkable, his death on a cross. Now, in John chapter 16, verses 27 and 28, I want to start there. Jesus opens up by, by saying something that, that reveals his heart for his disciples. John 16, 27, 28. I'm reading from the New King James. Here's what he says. He says, For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. In these verses, Jesus opens his heart to them, to his disciples, by describing his relationship with them through the lens or the context of his relationship with God. He talks about the love of the Father. In John 16, Jesus wanted his disciples to understand completely and fully his love for them. 
They had come to love him as a master, as a friend, but they wa he wanted them to understand and see his love for them in a deeper way. Now, the verse we just read in 27 and 28 sa is saying that it is when we fall into a relationship with Jesus and understand who he is and understand what he has done for us, what we see is, is we are appreciating the love of God for us. John 3.16, you know, there's a reason why it's a very popular verse. For God so loved the world, or, or it could be translated, God loved the world in this way. This is how God loved the world. That he gave, he gave his only unique, not just begotten, but unique son. That whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Knowing the love of God is foundational to our existence. Not just as Christians, friends, but, but as human beings. We cannot truly live a life of satisfaction and contentment without a knowledge of this love. And many experience it without even realizing that they are experiencing it as they go through life on a daily basis. We have the, the luxury of having the word of God and, and being able to study it and, and, and to see how God intersects with us, to be able to understand that love, that love that is without dimension. Now, what I'm talking about goes all the way back to Eden. And that's why I'm saying that it's foundational to every human being. We, we, were, we were built this way. In Eden, there was a questioning of the love of the Father, which led to Eve eating the fruit and Adam following suit. Remember in the garden, the, the enemy, or, or Satan, the adversary, he raised doubts about the faithfulness, the trustworthiness, and love of God when he asked Eve the question, you know, did God say you can eat of any fruit? of the tree? Did God say that? Did God say you could eat anything? In other words, can you rely on the word of the God that you serve? Is he trustworthy? Does he really love you? Is he holding something back from you? Does he not want you to live to your fullest potential? One of the greatest dangers today is taking the love of God for granted. The Bible tells us that the children of Israel did not enter the land of Canaan after about a six-month journey, and they were on the cusp of the land of Canaan, on the cusp of crossing in, but the Bible tells us they did not enter because of unbelief. Now the question is, what is it that they did not believe? We, we could say it was a lack of faith, they didn't believe in God, but, but what is it exactly that they did not believe? I want to take a look at Numbers. Numbers chapter 14, verse 8. This is very interesting to me as I was looking at this text in Numbers chapter 14, verse 8. First of all, Numbers 14, it describes the spies being sent into Canaan. Both uh, chapter 13 and 14 describes who they are, the tribes they came from, and, and when they went there and they spent those days in, in the land of Canaan and they spied it out and they, and they saw uh, fruits that were, were beyond their imagination. They, they saw a land that flows with milk and honey, a land that they could go into and, and, and just put a seed on the ground and it would sprout. They, they saw an opportunity, a place where they can live and they can thrive. They all saw that. They also saw the people who lived there. And the people who lived there were an, an intimidating people, a, a people that they were afraid they would have to conquer in order to be in that land and live there. So in, in Numbers chapter 14, verse 8, we have heard the report of, of the ten spies who said, we can't do it. We can't get in there. That's the, the, the people that are in there are too much to conquer. 
We've heard the report of Caleb, who said, yes, we can, with, with God's help, let us go up at once. I'm reading from 1330. Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. And then it's very interesting what, what Joshua says. It's very interesting what Joshua says in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 8. I'm going to start with verse 6 and read through verse 8. Here's what it says. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who spied the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke all to the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, the land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. This is Joshua and Caleb actually speaking. And then it says in verse 8, If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which is flows with milk and honey. Joshua and Caleb said, If the Lord delights in us. What does that mean for the Lord to delight in us? This word delight in, in the Hebrew language has, has, a, has a meaning which means to have a deep, intimate love for. A deep, intimate love for someone. It's, it's used to describe the, the feeling that a, a man has when they're falling in love with, with, with a woman. Just deep, intimate love and, and adoration and, and affection. Joshua and Caleb, they understood the depth of God's love for the children of Israel. They knew that, that God delighted in them. That if the Lord, that, that if that they used there was not applying to them, it was applying to those who says, Friends, you know that the Lord delights in us. And, and, and yes, let's, let's prove it. He, he delights in us. He loves us. Joshua and Caleb, they, they, they remembered that, that night of Passover when the angel of death passed over their homes. They remembered how those plagues came over, over Egypt and how God delivered them from each one of them. They remembered all the complaints were thirsty, were hungry as they were walking through the desert as they left Egypt. The people complaining that, that, that they had left food for, to be in this barren desert and they wished they could go back. And, and they remembered how God, who, who delighted in them, had provided for their every need. God heard their cry and he provided for them. Joshua and Caleb, they were confident of God's love for his people. They loved God with all their heart and they pleaded with the people to forget about the giants in the land and move forward in faith. Friends, we can move forward in faith when we understand the love of God. When we know with great assurance that God loves us and, and, and desires our, our, our best, we can move forward in faith and confidence. He wanted them to move forward in faith and confidence into a land which flows with milk and honey. This is the land that God promised them through Moses. I want to take a look at another verse just to explore that concept of the land of milk and honey. And what it's contrasted with when God is speaking with Moses, Exodus chapter 3, verse 17. Exodus chapter 3, verse 17. And here we find Moses. He's at the burning bush. And here God is, is giving him a rundown of what he's going to do for the people. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 17, this is what I'm going to do for the children of Israel through you. And he said, 317, and I have said, I will bring you out, bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites 
and the Hivites and the Jebusites to a land flowing with milk and honey. So they would leave from affliction into a land flowing with milk and honey. God promises to bring them out of this slavery, of this place where, where, where they are not at peace, to a place of peace. The land of milk and honey is a place of peace where the children of Israel can live in full trust and confidence under the love of God. Our land of milk and honey is when we all get to heaven and we, we can see with confidence the way God has led us. But until we get there, we, we continue to grow in that confidence, continue to grow in that faith. You see, friends, what's happening here in, 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 in Exodus and what we read in Numbers is exactly what Jesus was referring to in John chapter 16 and verse 33. We didn't quite get there yet. We were looking at verses 27 and 28. I want to go back to John chapter 16, and I want to finally get to verse, is, uh, verse 33. So John 16, I want to look at verse 33. Because in verse 27, which we read, he spoke about the love of God. He spoke about the love of the Father. This revelation of, of God's love opened the eyes of the disciples to see Jesus as God's son. Oh, you are the one that came forth from the Father, or, or, or the actual translation, or sits beside the Father. And now Jesus, in, in verse 33, he's sharing the results of what happens when you understand the love of God and his relationship with the Father and, and, and the Father's relationship to us. Here's what it says in John 16, 33. Many of you have heard it. It says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Peace is the result of understanding God's love. Jesus spoke all these words so that they could know God's peace. This is the peace they would know even in the midst of tribulation. These things I have spoken to you that you may have peace. Tribulation refers to troubles which inflict direct sufferings and direct distress physically, emotionally, financially, spiritually, socially. These are all tribulations. When you're experiencing suffering or, or distress in any of these these uh, arenas. Friends, we as Christians are subject to these to tribulations, to these tribulations. Jesus said, in the world you will. He didn't say you might. He didn't say you may. He said you will have tribulation. Right now, friends, we're facing a time in history which is unprecedented. Unemployment rates are rising day by day. Our, our church doors are, are closed. COVID-19 cases continue to, to trend upwards. Jesus calls for us to take courage because he has overcome the world. But sometimes, sometimes, friends, the burdens of this world leads to a case of what I titled our sermon today, Peace Interrupted. Sometimes the, the burdens of, of what happens in this world will, will interrupt your peace. And, and, and it's not that you stop following God. It's, it's not that you stop believing in God. It, it's just that, that there are times in, in life when, when the troubles interrupt our overall peace, the overall peace that we experience as Christians. Isaiah 26.3 tells us that God keeps those in complete peace, whose eyes are focused on him. Proverbs 18.10 tells us 
that it reminds us that, that God's name is a strong tower. Those who run to it find safety there, find peace there. These promises are true. They are reliable. We are to take them and hold them and internalize them and use them on a daily basis. But the Christian life is often filled with stormy moments where the peace of God in our souls is interrupted by the chaos of this life. So how do we cope? How do we cope when things seem to be a little overwhelming? I'd like to take a look at the narrative of Jesus calming the winds and the waves. It's found in two places in Scripture. Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 27, and also in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 40, 41. I want to take a look at the Mark narrative. And I want to focus on Mark, but I may take some elements from Matthew as we're looking at Mark. But the reason I want to focus on the Mark narrative it is because we, we need to understand the perspective. John Mark, he was a disciple of Peter. Mark was actually the first gospel, not the first book in the New Testament, but it was the first gospel, uh, scholars believe, that was composed. It was the first one that was written, that was uh, put to, put to uh, papyrus, if you will, <laughs> not to paper. It was the first gospel that was, that was written out. And, and John Mark, was, it was written to, to people to show that, that Jesus is the Son of God. And, and if you read the book of Mark, you'll see miracle after miracle after miracle. You'll see proof that Jesus is not just some man. Now, Mark, John Mark wrote this based on what people believe was a secondhand witness from the Apostle Peter. So there are details in, in John Mark that you won't find in other places because there's details that, that, that Peter added in that, that would describe things. And if you read the, the compare the narratives of Matthew 8 and Mark 4, you, you'll notice that, that there are some differences between the two. It's looking at Jesus from the perspective of being a healer and a miracle worker. Now, with that said, I want to go to Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. And what we're looking at, remember, what we're looking at is how do we cope when the peace of God in our souls is interrupted by the chaos of life? We see this happening in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 31. Mark 4, 35 to 31. Uh, you can follow along in your Bibles if you have them with you. Uh, I'm going to... We're going to be focusing on this scripture for the rest of the time we have together today. The rest of the time I'll be speaking. And here's what it says in Mark 4, 35 to 41. It says, I'm reading from the New King James once again. It says, on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and, and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, <clears throat> Peace. Be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? We see here from this account a close reading of this narrative. Both narratives together shows us, and we see this more in Matthew, that, that Jesus had been preaching, he had been teaching, and, and according to the Matthew narrative, he had been healing all day. So sometimes we think of Jesus healing a person there and healing a person there and teaching a sermon here and there, and he's just kind of walking with his disciples and, and sitting down and, 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 and talking, but, but Jesus was a busy man. If you read scriptures, especially just to 
the little uh, almost parenthetical verses that talk about, and all the multitude came to them to him, and he healed them. Well, how much is a multitude? He was healing people all day. He was tired. He was exhausted. And he needed time to rest, which is why he said, let us cross over to the other side. Let's get on the boat. I can take a nap. Let's go to the other side. Now, they set sail to the other side of the lake. Peter, a master uh, sailor, as well as a fisherman, might have been his boat, might not have been. It might have been a boat they rented. Anyway, it was, a, it was a boat, and there were other boats in the sea. And this is, a, this is a detail that Peter would have known. Something that Peter would have said, yes, there were other boats in the sea. And, and during that time, it was, according to the, uh, the, the, the Jewish scholar Josephus, it wasn't uncommon to see three to 400 boats sailing in the Sea of Galilee. Fishing was a big thing. That was the big... Uh, uh, that was the, that was the big... Um, job or, or commercial uh, trade, that's what I'm trying to say, of that day. Now, so they set sail to the other side of the lake, many boats on the sea. And during the course of the journey, a, a windstorm arose. Now, I want you to understand something. It says a windstorm arose, but when they left the shore, they left prepared. The disciples did not foolishly set out in, in a storm. In fact, they usually didn't encounter storms at night. It was evening time, the Bible says, and, and usually storms would, would come in, in, in the afternoon. A mixture of the, the, the cool and the warm air coming together. The Sea of Galilee is, is some 600 feet below sea level. And the warm water on the, on, the, on, the, on the sea would mix with the cool water from the mountain, cool air, I said water, the warm air on the sea and, and, and the cool air from the mountains would come together and cause storms. But now it's evening, so the, the, the temperatures had, had equalized, so there should be no storm. Everything should be fine going across, smooth sailing. They didn't see this one coming. Even though several of these men were expert fishermen, they knew how to handle a boat, they got caught without warning by this windstorm. They left shore prepared, prepared for what they commonly would do as they cross over the Sea of Galilee, which they had done many a time. Jesus was with them. Jesus, the great miracle worker, was with them at the time. They avoided the usual time for storms, and, and they were equipped with the knowledge of what to do in case of a storm. They knew how to take evasive action against waves. But this storm came, and this storm was beyond their control. The storm came, and, and they were unprepared for something of this magnitude. And to make matters worse, Jesus was sleeping through it. The peace that they felt leaving shore, going across the sea, going on the other side, the peace that they felt because they were prepared was interrupted by this storm. Friends, sometimes in our lives, we've taken our times for our morning devotion, we've read our Bibles, we've, we've prayed, we've, we've sang our hymns, we've, we've, we've sought God through the Word, we, and we go in, into our lives spilling over with the peace of God. We have peace like a river in our soul, and we're ready to take on the world. But friends, even when we're ready to face the world, even when the peace of God is there, even when Jesus is in the boat with us, and he's going with us. It's still possible, friends, as we see in this narrative, that our peace may be interrupted by what's going on in the world. Because Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulations. We may face a trial or a circumstance that comes out of nowhere. An unforeseen medical expense, an unforeseen illness, a, this, this coronavirus thing that's going around. It hits us when we least expect it. it. It hits us 
when we least deserve it. We were ready for this. We put Jesus in the equation. We're soaring on wings of eagles, but something happens in life to interrupt our peace. Feels like Jesus is sleeping in the boat. He's sleeping on the job. How could this happen? How do we regain that peace, this peace that's interrupted by the tribulations of life? Let's go back to the narrative. It says in verse 38, and he was in the stern, back in a boat, he was asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and said, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? The Bible tells us that they woke him up and says, don't you care about us? We are your followers. We are your disciples. We, we are your friends. We are dying here. We, we can't control this storm. We're, we're trying to, to, to throw the water out and it's coming in faster than we can get rid of it. We need you now. But by looking at this, it seems like their words were, 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 were more criticism of Jesus not, not being awakened and on the job, not being there in their situation when they need him rather than a cry for help. Sometimes, friends, when the storms of life hit, hits a square in the jaw, feels like Jesus is not sleep listening. Feels like he's sleeping on the job. It feels like he, he's, he's not coming as he should be coming. We, we have done our part by, by spending time with him. We, we have him with us on the boat and, and the unexpected storm comes and, and it rages on and, and it's out of control and, and he seems to be inactive. So we cry out to him. The next verses tell us exactly how Jesus deals with our storms. I love this. Here's what it says. It says right here in verse 39. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. The Bible tells us that he arose. That word arose, what it means is, is that he woke up fully alert. He woke up and he was ready to, to be there for his disciples. He wasn't, he wasn't groggy, wondering where he was. He, he, he wasn't going to hit the snooze button and, and, and wait five more minutes. He didn't tell him, just give me another ten minutes of sleep. I'll, I'll take care of it in a second. It says that when they went to him and said, we are perishing, the next verse says, then he arose. He was up and he was on the job and, and he was ready for action. He arose and, and what he did is he arose and, and without speaking to his disciples, he addressed the problem. He remembered the promise he made in Psalm chapter 50 verse 15. Psalm 50 verse 15 where it says, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. When we call on God, when we call on Jesus in the day of trouble, before he addresses us, before he even looks to us, he addresses the problem. The Bible tells us that he arose and he went right to the wind. He went right to the sea. He didn't do anything with the disciples. He went right to the problem. He is concerned about deliverance and, and giving us back our peace. He knew their peace was interrupted. And he wanted to give them that peace back. So Jesus rises up. He turns his attention to the howling winds and, and the tidal waves and, and utters two phrases. Peace, be still. Literally saying, hush, silence. The storm was out of control. Their fears were out of control. But Jesus was always in control. Even as he slept, that storm never had a chance. He has power over all forces of nature. And he listens to the appeals of all who love him. The peace that was once interrupted, it is now returned. Because Jesus, when he said, peace be still, when he said, hush, silence, 
He was not only talking to the elements, but he was also talking to the disciples because he knows if he takes care of the issue and the disciples know that he's the one taking care of the issue, that when that issue is resolved, their peace will be resolved. The peace that was once interrupted has returned. But now Jesus, wanting to give them the, 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 the fullness of peace, he turns his attention to them because now they're calm and everything is okay. But we see in, in the next verse, verse 40, it says, But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? He turned to them asking, Why the fear? And where is the faith? He rebuked the problem, and now he's turning his attention to his disciples. Because, friends, they, they believe they have the peace now. They believe the peace is back. But Jesus wants to put it back completely. He wants them to learn an important lesson. Followers of Jesus Christ need boldness in the face of life's challenges and trust in God's ability to bring them through. Followers of, of Jesus Christ are urged to remember that peace will often be interrupted in life. Jesus said it in John 16, 33. You will have tribulations, but be of good courage. Be of good courage. Have faith. Don't fear, because I have overcome. Just as he overcame the storm, he wants to overcome the storm in your life. What's the storm in your life today, friends? What is it today that, that, that feels overwhelming? What is it today where it, it seems like Jesus is asleep on the job? Oh, I urge you, friends, call out to him. Call out to him, and in the day you call out to him, he will answer. He will offer peace, and he will offer silence. He will offer hush over that trial. We will often have trials, but take courage. Because Jesus overcame. Take courage because Jesus will overcome no matter how rough the storm you're facing in life. He is there. Let us pray. Father in heaven, oh master of the storm, we thank you so much that no matter how much it seems like life is out of control, how much it seems like we, we can't handle the, the things that are going on, that, that you are there in the boat with us. And, and even though it seems like you may be sleeping, you are in control. So Lord, we turn our eyes to you as we deal with the situation we're dealing with in our uh, country today. We turn our eyes to you as we, as we think about our church and the direction that you would desire us to go in. We turn our eyes to you, Lord, as we think about the issues and, and problems that we are going on in our household. Because we know that you, O oh Lord, are the Prince of Peace. So bring peace to our hearts. Bring peace to our minds. Bring peace over our beings and link us up to the Prince of Peace, in whose name we pray. Let us say amen and amen. Have a blessed Sabbath. So nice to have this opportunity to come together. It's my hope and prayer that your Sabbath will be restful and that you will be with us when we join again next week for our next online service. And, and look on our YouTube page for videos that are coming during the week. We have a one-minute devotional that's being done by our head elder, uh, Tyson Page. You're very, very insightful. Please uh, take a minute of your time and go in and listen to that one-minute uh, devotional. We all, we're also going to have some other types of uh, content on there that you're really going to find to be a blessing. So please take time and uh, look at our YouTube page, uh, Lincoln Amazing Grace. 
and uh, I'm sure you'll be blessed. May God bless you. May God keep you. May God make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace.